Okay, here we go. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Rashu Christi live stream. Uh, yeah, happy New Year, uh, uh, twenty uh, happy 2020, uh, 2021. And uh, yeah, my name is uh, Karnu van Yerden um, with Rashu Christi. And yeah, for all those who um, do not know who we are, Rashu Christi is an international uh, campus apologetics ministry. And so our mission is twofold. In one sense, we want to arm believers um, with reasons um, for their faith so that they can understand what they believe and why they believe it. And on the other side, um, our mission is also to give an open platform for those uh, who are skeptical of Christianity and who have questions regarding the Christian faith. And so... Yeah, that, that is our mission. And as you've most likely seen on all our other YouTube channels, we discuss every topic underneath the sun, um, from economics, politics, ethics, you name it. Uh, nothing is too uh, controversial for us. And uh, indeed, tonight's uh, topic is indeed a very controversial one. Uh, but yeah, and controversy is awesome. Never shy away from it. <laughs> But yeah, so uh, tonight uh, we will be discussing a very interesting um, a topic with regards to, uh, which touches a lot on Old Testament um, dating and chronology and historicity and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, and tonight our speaker, Dr. Willem McLeod, will um, speak to us about the Sumerian Hypothesis. So before we get started, I just want to inter introduce Dr. McLeod. Uh, Dr. Willem McLeod is an independent South African scholar with a wide field of interest spanning ancient Middle Eastern studies, Kantian philosophy, and philosophy of science. He has got a PhD in nuclear physics, uh, MSc in um, physics, MA in philosophy of science, an honors degree in philosophical hermeneutics, and an M MBL. He's an innovative thinker and researcher who has produced new and original work in various fields, including the new interpretation of the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, a Kantian interpretation of quantum physics, among other things, providing a solution for the well-known measurement problem, a new ancient Middle Eastern chronological model, as well as a Sumerian hypothesis explaining the large amount of Mesopotamian material in the primal evil history of the book of Genesis all of which has been published in peer review journals. So yes, um, also if you want to know more about uh, um, Dr. McLeod and the work that he is doing, you can check out in the description of our video, the link to uh, his webs, uh, these, he and his colleagues website CORE. Um, it's recently launched, as if I understand uh, correctly. You can go there and have, look, have a look at all the new articles and stuff they publish uh, um, uh, published quite frequently so yeah and also just a reminder uh, Rashu Christi is a non-profit organization so if you uh, please would also please consider if you wish to support us in the work that we're doing uh, please also look at the description below there is a link to our don donation on our page and also if you want to have uh, access to on various different articles and resources also check out the link to our uh, main website so yeah but yeah without further ado uh, dr mcleod uh, take us away welcome thank you for having me yes yes so uh, yeah if i if i may ask uh, tell me tell us before we get into this tell me a bit on this sumerian hypothesis what got you like interested in this work, you know, what was your motive for, you know, engaging in this study? Because uh, I can see definitely you have a very a wide range of interests. So what drew you towards uh, th this study? Yeah, the ancient world had always been a topic of great interest to me. And uh, the Sumerian world, the ancient Mesopotamian world, I think it's about 30 years now that I've been studying the history and so forth of that ancient period. I also had the great pleasure of being part of a cuneiform reading group while still living in the north of South Africa in Pretoria. 
um, at one of the universities, they, they had a, a reading group and it was such a pleasure to read the Kony from texts. And I think that gave me a certain love for the Sumerian language. And I've also visited and toured throughout the Middle East to many countries I've been. I visited the marshlands in the south of Mesopotamia, where the ancient Sumerian civilization once flourished. And uh, so I just have a great interest. I just love this ancient world and these things. And while studying these things and reading all the different uh, texts from the Sumerian era, uh, both uh, Sumerian and Akkadian texts. Uh, slowly but steadily, I came to the conclusion that there's, there's an amazing amount of agreement between what we find in that early period in Mesopotamia and what we find in the early uh, primeval history in the book of Genesis. And um, that a correspondence was very intriguing and I studied it. I actually brought out a small book on that about 10 years or so ago as a, just as a first level of trying to engage more seriously with that. And eventually I published uh, formally a more extensive article in the peer review journal on the Sumerian hypothesis. So it was a long time in the making. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's great. And if I if I understand, um, if, where, if uh, people can find this article, it's published in the Journal of Semantics, if I understand correctly. Journal for Semantics, yeah. Journal for Semantics. Okay. That yeah. JSEM, yeah. yeah. Okay, awesome. It was so published you... in uh, two thousand and twenty, the second, the second edition. Yeah, they have two editions uh, in a year. First and it's in the second one. Okay, okay, cool, awesome. So yeah, folks, if you want to have a look at that, go look up uh, that um, that article in the journal. Uh, I've had the privilege of uh, going through it and reading it, and it is definitely very interesting. And what uh, Dr. McLeod is proposing is definitely, like I say, very controversial, especially in light of uh, a lot of modern uh, Old Testament uh, critical studies and stuff like that, uh, which leads me to the Next question, um, I think before we dive into what you have to say regarding the Sumerian hypothesis, just to give a backdrop on what's the climate regarding uh, the discussion of this in the academia, because for years, the dominant position on like um, regarding these studies has been what has been called uh, the Babylonian hypothesis. So maybe if, uh, can you just give a definition and an explanation of uh, what exactly is the Babylonian hypothesis and what it entails? Yeah, the main hypothesis that's currently held in academic circles is the Babylonian hypothesis. hypothesis. And according to this, um, the Mesopotamian material in the book of Genesis was borrowed from Babylonian sources. So in the earlier days, at the beginning of the previous uh, century, um, they developed what is called the documentary hypothesis. And the documentary hypothesis, actually, there are four different sources is proposed for the Pentateuch. And um, the first, the older one is the J source that's called after the name Jave, uh, about 900 BC. So some scholars believe that this J source um, actually included some, some a little bit of Mesopotamian material. Uh, then the other source, a, lit, a slightly lighter, uh, it's the E source, the Elohim source. Uh, it's about 700 BC. I would normally date that source. Um, that was in the begin in the early years. That was the primal source that they believe that contained the, material, the Mesopotamian material. And then the D source, the Deuteronomy source, that's uh, from the time of King Josh, this, um, this Josiah. Mm -hmm. And then the, the last source is the priestly source, and that dates from the exile, the exilic period. So these sources actually developed from a certain view that the ancient scholars had about the development, evolution of relig religion. So they believed that uh, is the Israelite 
or the religion of the, of, of the early Israelites followed the same pattern. So they believe that the earlier um, sources, uh, in the early days, it was an animist kind of religion that the Israelites had. Later, it developed in a kind of henotheism where one particular god was um, worshipped in a more centralized way than the others. And eventually, a kind of monotheism developed and a more ethical approach and the kind of ethics that we find in the prophets. So we have this process, the evolutionary process, and that was the main reason why these sources were dated according to this particular period. But after some time, um, it slowly but steadily became clear that that whole model um, was not sustainable. So this whole model about the evolution of the early history or religion of Israel was just plain wrong. So that model was dropped, but the sources were kept. <laughs> and also the traditional way of dating those sources were kept. It became an established way of thinking in the academic society. And uh, as time processed later on, it so happened that uh, the dates were pushed lower and lower for the Pentateuch and then also the Primeval history, which is our major concern tonight. And eventually, um, I think in our day, uh, most uh, scholars, especially from the biblical criticism school, would like to date it to the exile, the exilic period, and later even than that. And they would, um, I think nowadays, for the most part, um, I believe that the peace source, the peace source is the one containing the Mesopotamian material. And some would just say distinguish between a P and a non-peace source. The distinguishment between the different sources has also become cluttered and blurred. And more and more scholars, I think, are moving away from that model also. And they are thinking in terms of a more unified, um, synchronistic kind of model uh, nowadays. But that's the background. So they believe basically that in the Jewish tradition, this Mesopotamian material that we find in the beginning of the book of Genesis in the primeval history, that's between chapters 1 and 11, originated from a borrowing from uh, Babylonia, from texts that became available to the Jews, that if it's the J source or even the E source, they would say certain texts were discovered, discovered say, uh, about the deluge or so, and that, that impacted on the Israeli, uh, the, the history or the religion of Israel. And then later on, but clearly the Babylonian exile uh, in their minds must have had an important impact on the way, reason that we have Mesopotamian material in the Bible, especially in the book of Genesis. So slowly but steadily, the link became fixed in their minds that the Babylonian, uh, the Babylonian apathesis means that during the exile, Israel became um, acquainted with the Babylonian ideas. They borrowed it, and that's how it came and entered the book of Genesis. So many of these people from the biblical criticism school, they don't take the story of Abram serious. Um, when I wanted, at one stage, I wanted to do a master's at one of the universities. And uh, uh, I was allowed to do it, but um, there was a restriction and that was, I may never, or I may not accept or allow for a historical Abram. Sure. So there's a general view in the scholarly circles, uh, circles that Abram is definitely not an historical person. And that was that's also the reason why they find uh, in the exilic period, they find the reasons why the Jews actually develop these ideas. And, you know, so that's that's how they see the Babylonian or as they see it, the Mesopotamian material in the book mm. of Genesis, yeah. So that's the background, yes. that's the current yes. view. <laughs> yes, and, and thank you, yeah. And definitely we can see how this, the Babylonian hypothesis definitely, like you've already mentioned, and uh, the points you touched on has a very, it's has some severe consequences for our 
view on like the historicity of large parts of the Old Testament, um, where things become a bit more like reconstructed myth more than it could be possible that there was some sort of a historical reality and because it's so far removed from whatever was way back when i've even heard some versions of the hypothesis have some sort of a i think especially in the modern age with the rise of critical theory and identity politics there's a whole sort of a psychological type of explanation the israelites were distraught and they wanted a new narrative that they wanted to build for themselves to create their new identity and um, and stuff like that. So that combi- compounded with already all the other things that have come from the older critical schools. Yes, it's uh, definitely, well, also to my knowledge, I've, I've also seen with my reading, definitely a hypothesis that uh, persists. But uh, yeah, moving on now to the Sumerian hypothesis, uh, which is the main uh, topic of our discussion tonight then is... Uh, yeah, could you tell us a bit more about that? I think before you, we get into it, just for some of our folks out there that might not be aware of all the ancient history, because the Sumerian hypothesis, um, you know, linking with the name Sumer, which is one of the oldest, if I understand correctly, one of the oldest civilizations uh, uh, in the world. So, yeah, if you could uh, just branch out for us on that. Thank you. That would be cool. Yeah, so uh, Sumer... Uh, was the first uh, civilization in world history was in Sumer, the Sumerian civilization. Uh, Before that, we had great cultures, historical cultures, but it's uh, generally recognized that the first civilization was the Sumerian one. Uh, The Sumerian uh, civilization came into being in the fourth millennium BC, and it came to an end towards the end of the third millennium BC in about 2000 BC. It was a great civilization in many respects, um, many ways that they um, had the first on the table. For example, they were the first to uh, produce uh, surplus grain and sell it off, make a profit. Mm. (laughs) Good businessman, yeah, yeah. And they was able to develop a highly sophisticated administrative system um, throughout an enormously large geographical area, because the during the towards the end of the what we call the Uruk period, that's the early um, part or the heroic part, which we will also come back to tonight, of the Sumerian uh, um, civilization uh, during the this period there was what is called the Uruk expansion. So the Sumerian influence it can be seen up high in the mountains, mountainous areas towards the north and towards the west. Um, so it was a really a great civilization. But the most important innovative success of this civilization was, um, was writing. Uh, phonetic writing. They developed it. They, was the first, uh, to, they were the first to develop phonetic writing. So there was some time in which they had a kind of pictographic writing, which was more very simple, you know, had a certain simple cor- a symbol corresponding to a certain item and so forth. But at some point, they gave a certain phonetic value to this particular sign. And they arrange the signs according to their phonetic value, and phonetic uh, phonetic writing were born. And that was uh, about uh, it was early in the third millennium BC, in my view, according to my chronology, that would have been in about say two thousand nine hundred BC around that period. So that was a really great civilization. Um, and what should not be forgo- forgotten is that the Akkadians, uh, that's the Semites that lived among the Sumerians, um, was also very important, um, especially towards the north. Just to the north of Sumer was a geographical area that was first called Uri. It was later called Akkad. And eventually the whole area became known as Sumer and Akkad. 
So the Acadians are also very, very important in this history. And towards the north of Suma, certain cities, typical Sumerian cities like Uruk or Eridu or Napur and so forth, right in the south, which was at that stage close to the sea, to the Persian Gulf. And then further to the north were the Semites and the city like Kish was very important and there was a Semitic uh, dynasty ruling there from very early on. And the first kings, the first people to give kings to the world seems to have been the Kishites. So it was in the north amongst the Semites that the first kings came on the scene. Later that became a very popular title, King of Kish in, uh, in Mesopotamia, especially during the late Sumerian period. And eventually the Akkadians actually ruled for about 200 years over um, not only Sumer and Akkad, but over the extent of the known world. It was the first empire, the first world empire was the Akkadian Empire. And then after that period, there was a return. The Sumerians were still in the land uh, in, in the southern Mesopotamia. They still held important positions. And after the Akkadian Empire came to a fall, they regained power. And there was the last period, which we call the Earth III uh, Empire, during which the last Sumerian rulers were on the scene. That was just before the Abrahamic period. So when they came to an end, um, that was in about 2060 in my, in my dating, 2060 BC, uh, that was when the Sumerian rule over those southern parts of Mesopotamia came to an end. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that, uh, that's really helpful. Yes, because... Um, we can already see the, the point of controversy arriving here because uh, Sumer being such an ancient civilization um, and also the gap between that and the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Um, it, if the primeval history, like you say, those first uh, key chapters in uh, the book of Genesis are more influenced and have more themes akin to the period in Sumer, it would push back the sort of like the dating and the chronology way back uh, and actually in accordance, like I, I know you argue in the article uh, and also you're on an article uh, on chronology with uh, uh, Abraham's period and um, uh, and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, I, I think um, uh, that's very interesting because um, yeah, it's the typical argument from the Babylonian hypothesis is like, well, look at the, Babylonian themes and the Babylonian, um, you know, illusions and motifs uh, in, in the text, you know, there's like flood and, you know, they talk, they take uh, some of the stuff, if I understand correctly, from the Enuma Elish and stuff like that. Um, but in your article, you argue there are actually older lines uh, that can actually be traced to the Sumerian uh, sort of culture itself. So I think what uh, we can, the next question we can go on to is like, how and when did this Sumerian material enter the biblical tradition of, uh, of Israel? Yeah, so in my view, um, I believe we should take the Abrahamic narrative seriously. So um, that's a major point. We'll come back to that later on, I believe. But um, if we take that serious, then we can say, remember, Abraham originated in Ur um, of the Chaldeans. It's set in the, in the Bible, but that was a later addition, maybe made by Ezra or somebody, because the Chaldeans is not that old. They only entered the, that land from about, about 1000 BC. But that was just to specify which Ur is involved here in this mm story. So it's the Ur in Sumer. Now Ur was also the city where the last Sumerian kings ruled the world. So that was the world from which Abraham came. So now what is interesting if one read the primeval history in the book of Genesis, that's chapters 1 
to 11 until we get to the Abrahamic history. Then one will see that it's actually a preamble to the Abrahamic history. It seems that it's the prehistory of the Abrahamic family that evolved into Israel. So that's how I believe that the biblical author uh, presents this primeval history. It's not just an isolated part of Genesis. It's presented as if it is the prehistory of the Abrahamic family. And when we, once we see it in that way, then immediately the implication is that this history belonged to, this tradition belonged to the Abrahamic family. And they brought it with them when they migrated from Ur, from Sumer to Canaan. So it's very simple. What I'm saying is when the Abrahamic family moved from Sumer, Sumer and the Cut actually, to Canaan, they brought this source material, but was, which was later used to write the primeval history. They brought it with them from Ur to Canaan, and it became part of um, the, 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 the tradition of the Abrahamic fam the family that was handed down in their circles. And later on, we'll see, in my view, it was even written down, the source material during that period. We have good reason to think so. So that's a basic way of thinking regarding the Sumerian hypothesis. hypothesis. So what I'm just saying is that uh, the problem is often that scholars would just assume that the Mesopotamian material in the Primal history must have arisen from a borrowing from, the, from Babylon during the exilic period, because that's uh, the one period when Israel was really closely connected and involved in Babylon. Um, but that is a presupposition, and we have to show why we believe that, because it becomes a circle argument if we say, well, we have the Babylonian hypothesis, hypothesis because it's taken from Babylon because this is the most likely period. It's not a good argument. We have to show why we believe that that's actually during the, ex the exilic period that this borrowing took place. So in the history of Israel, in my view, there are only two periods when such a borrowing could have taken place. Once we study the primeval history, we see that the material, the Mesopotamian the material in the primeval history is extensive. It's an enormous amount of material. It's right, it's interwoven right through every chapter of Genesis 1 to 11. So this kind of extensive borrowing, in my view, could not have taken place during periods when Israel was not directly in contact with the Mesopotamian world. So the only two periods that I think that is worthy of serious consideration is then the Abrahamic period, when that family, according to the biblical tradition, were living in Sumer, and then later on the exilic period, when Israel was, was taken into, into exile to Babylon. So the question is, why would one prefer the one above the other? And we'll come back to that again. But what is extremely important is that one should not just immediately accept that the borrowing was light. You know, I once attended a lecture and the person, the lecturer, is a, um, a scholar at one of the universities and he was discussing some of the things in Genesis 1 and he was just um, referring to the Assyrian period and showing all these things can be linked to the Assyrian period. But what he didn't say is, why did he choose the Assyrian period? He could have chosen any other period because those same ideas were around for thousands of years. Why pick the Assyrian period? So there must be a reason. We must decide, you know, this, if these ideas were around for such a long time, why would one pick? So he picked the Assyrian period because of the, the first... The, people, the northern tribes being in exile during that period, I believe. But the problem is that there's no, absolutely no signs of Babylonian influence 
in the Mesopotamian material in the Prima Bolista. That's amazing. If you study the Mesopotamian material, you will find that there's absolutely no sign at all of all the developments that took place in Babylon since the time of the old Babylonian period. That's from the time of Hammurabi. In the 30th year, he conquered the whole of southern Mesopotamia, a large part even to the north. Is that the 1800s? Yeah, that was in 1818. Yeah, the old, old, old Babylonian period was it? Yeah, so Sorry. from the old Babylonian period, the middle Babylonian, Babylonian period, the new Babylonian period, the period of the exile, all the developments, there were many developments that took place during the Babylonian period, the period that the Babylonians, that the Amorites that were living in the south in Mesopotamia, their ways of thinking, their religion, their gods, Many things happened. The whole world changed when the Babylonians took over. And none of that is reflected in the material in Genesis. Nothing. All, all the material can be traced back to the period before that, to the Sumerian and Akkadian uh, literature and information that they have available to us. Okay. So I think that's just the main a reason the, why yes. um, I have chosen to develop this hypothesis further. Yeah. Okay. And may I ask, could you mention, uh, if we're going to the particular, what particular, you know, evidence is there um, in, you know, the parallels between the Mesopotamian literature and what we have in Genesis? What are some examples that you can give us to further um, illustrate your point. Well, we'll have to work through the Prima Bolle history to do yes. that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because it's an enormous amount of information, you know. Um, so I believe that the worldview that we find in Genesis 1, we can come back, I'll first just give a general overview. We can, we'll find that the worldview that we find in Genesis 1 is just the ancient worldview of the Sumerians. If you read the Sumerian texts, it's just their way of thinking, their worldview. Is, um, also, what we find is the motives, the particular motives that we find in the garden story. For example, God depicted as a potter who made Adam from clay. Um, Eve, that's been taken uh, and made from a rip and called life, baby life. Um, the tree in the middle of the garden with a snake at the tree. Um, these and other things are all things that's already uh, that we can find in the ancient Sumerian texts. So that's there. And then the stories in the Bible, in this part, the most of the stories have an equivalent in the ancient Sumerian tradition. So in my view, that doesn't mean that the Israelites borrowed it. Because if they borrowed it, you would, uh, there would be a much closer correspondence between the two traditions. So what we find is clearly similar traditions, similar themes and similar stuff, etc. But the differences are large enough, are too large to assume a direct borrowing. So the stories, I can mention quite a few of the stories also um, in the, um, in the you can maybe You can maybe we discuss maybe the Tower of Babel. That's a very interesting <laughs> one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the stories um, that I believe as is, is equivalent, um, the garden story, um, uh, featuring Adam and Eve, uh, that as an equivalent, Adam as equivalent in Adapa. Um, then the story of Enoch that was taken to heaven as an equivalent in the story of Itana. His name means he was he who was taken to heaven or to God. Um, then there's the story of the Nephilim that has a clear equivalent also. In Sumer, um, for example, the great Gildamesh, I think he's the archetype of, of the Nephilim. 
he was said to have uh, been sired by a kind of spiritual being, but the topic is brought, so I can just mention it. Then the story of, um, of, of if I mentioned the deluge, and then there's the story of Nimrod, uh, the mighty man. I believe that as a direct equivalent also. Um, and I believe that the Enmerkar of ancient Sumerian tradition has a very close parallel. And then also, as you have mentioned, the story of the confusion of language. <laughs> mm. So all these stories as an equivalent in the Sumerian or Akkadian traditions. Now, you've referred to the confusion of language. The confusion of language is also mentioned in Sumerian tradition, and it's especially connected. We find it in one of the stories that was written down during the Earth Three period, that's about 2000 BC. And um, that's actually an ancient oral tradition about the great heroic period that was handed down orally by the um, poets from that early time, the epic poets, etc. And they told the story about in Merkar, and in one of his stories a reference about his life, a reference is made to this confusion of language. It's called the spell of, let's just say, Inki, to make it simple. Inki was one of the gods of ancient Sumer. And uh, so later on, I think when we engage with the correspondence between um, the primeval history and the reconstruction of Sumerian tradition, um, I can also show how, where this confusion of language actually fit into history. I don't know whether you want me to mm. do it right now. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it, it, it would definitely be interesting. Yeah, please. So what I'm saying is that in the um, primeval history, most of that stuff, I believe, is stories that go back to the early period in Sumerian or in Mesopotamian tradition, and especially the Uruk period. Now, the Uruk period, that's, I believe, we should associate the Uruk period, that's, in my view, from the middle of the fourth uh, millennium BC, there we have a flood layer between the Ubaid and the Uruk periods, as we call it, that had been observed in various places in ancient Sumer, uh, uh, for example, at Ur and other places, it has been observed a massive clay layer. And uh, scholars had um, proposed, and I think there's a good case to be made that what actually happened was that the sea overran the land at that stage and the whole river structure that we later found was formed of co- because of that during that period that was between the Ubaid and the Uruk periods. Then follows the Uruk period. Now that was a period of uh, the great heroes of the ancient history of the Sumerian civilization. Now, directly after the flood, we read according to um, Sumerian tradition and in a reconstruction where one connects the first dynasty of Uruk with this Uruk period. So we should, we must make this connection. Then we find that uh, we have a certain person, Meskiach Kasher, he comes from the north. We read uh, most likely from the land of Arata, which would correspond to the biblical Ararat, because it's in the north. That's a long story, why it's so. But we do, be, do read that his son in Merkar was born in Arata. So most likely they came from there in Argeal. We read that he came and resided at the Temple of An. And archaeologically speaking, we find that there was a great deep of of the land at that stage, and then people came and new settlers came and um, live, resided in the area of the Temple of An, exactly as we find in this tradition about Meskiach Kasser. And it has been proposed by other authors, for example, David Rohr um, in his books has proposed 
that Meshkiah Kasher, the Kash, is actually the Kesh of by biblical tradition and the father of Nimrod. And um, his, his son was uh, um, in Merkar. And in Merkar, according to Sumerian tradition, was the one who built uh, the city of Uruk. And also, if one read the traditions about him in the literature, he also rebuilt the great temple platform of Eridu. That was the oldest one, according to tradition in Sumer. And that was a centralized uh, platform. All the peoples of the South came together at that spot. So that's where I believe we find the connection with the Tower of Babylon. Of Babylon. Okay. And the reason is very simple. In later times, Babylon, when the Babylonians came to Babylon, they borrowed a lot of the myths uh, and the religion of Eridu. So much so that Babylon was also written in cuneiform as what we call Nin Ki. Now, the key is a determinative. It's placed after the name of the city. It just says it says it's a place. Nin and then Ki. So this way of writing the name of Babylon was borrowed from Eridu. So one, for example, found that Berosus later on would say that Babylon was the earliest um, uh, 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 place of worship, which he actually means if it was Eridu. It wasn't Babylon. Babylon didn't exist at that stage. It wasn't on the map. So what was on the map was Eridu. There was a large temple platform. Everybody came together. And towards the end of the Uruk period, when phonetic writing was developed, Something happened. So before that time, they had a uniform convention of pronunciation. So all the signs was pronounced differently and connected to, to various items. But with phonetic writing, suddenly if you were a Semite or an Elamite living in Suma, this would have been garbage to you. You wouldn't have been able to understand it. And those people saw a religious context in all these things. So that must have been a massive, massive, massive confusion that resulted from that. And I believe this is exactly what the Babylonian tradition talks about in referring to the confusion of language. And then we find that this temple platform was left overnight, exactly as we find in the biblical tradition where we believe that the people were dispersed dispersed all over the world. So that's slightly more in detail and in depth discussion. Yeah, no, but that is a fusion of very, language. Yeah, that's <laughs> definitely very fascinating. Uh, especially when I read through the article, I'm like, hmm, this is uh, very interesting, the parallels and uh, how it uh, fits together as an explanation. So um, I wanted to ask just as a clarifying question, you mentioned, uh, you talk about like the similarities and dissimilarities now between the Sumerian literature and the biblical literature itself. Just, um, just tell me if, uh, if I understand your point there correctly, that um, there, are, there are similarities in the sense like they developed in the same cultural milieu. That, uh, that's because we see these parallels. But there's no, like you said, direct borrowing uh, from the literature itself. Otherwise, it would have been uh, much more similar. And so would the dissimilarities then between the Mesopotamian literature or the Sumerian literature itself and the biblical tradition, would the dissimilarities maybe give an indication that the biblical tradition, although it is developed in the same cultural milieu and maybe the same uh, time period, um, that it is maybe an independent account? Um, yeah, so what that, I'm saying yeah. is that these things developed from the same early cultural context. So the Akkadians, that means the Semites, and the early forebears of Abram living in Sumer and the Sumerians, they shared the same world. They shared the same stories. It was the same history that they shared. But when Abraham moved from there towards Canaan, he took these traditions, that's what I'm arguing for, he took these traditions with him. 
uh, from Sumer towards Canaan and it became part of the Israelite tradition. I believe, in fact, it was written down already in the Abrahamic period. I'll come back to that. Whereas in Mesopotamia, the Babylonians arrived on the scene slightly uh, later in my uh, chronological model, the published one, which has been uh, confirmed, I think, quite dramatically by the discovery after I published it. About four months later, I discovered that an epic of Kukishara has been um, found in one of the libraries in Germany. And it was a very important fund, and it actually showed that it agreed with my, uh, uh, it supported my Mesopotamian, um, my chronological model. And in this model, Abram is, uh, came to, to, from Sumer to, 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 to Canaan and from Haran slightly before the period, about say 20 years before um, we find that um, Amurabi um, became overlord of southern Mesopotamia. And the reason why we can be so accurate is in the Abrahamic story, we read about the Elamites that made an incursion into the northwestern parts um, of, 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 of Syria, the, the northeastern parts of Syria. And that agrees with the biblical story where we read how the Elamites came all the way to the Dead Sea even. Now, there's only one time, one, one incident during that period where it happened and that happened about 20 years before um, Hammurabi became overlord in 1818. So that gives a very good measure of dating uh, the Abrahamic story. So what I'm saying is that in the, Ab the Abrahamic family, they, in my view, uh, brought this tradition from Sumer and what is extremely important about the Abrahamic story is the oracles. So we read there's quite a lot of oracles where God spoke to Abram. Now, oracles is also attested to in Mari in the West. And Abram on his way towards Canaan would have passed Mari. And there a lot of oracles had been found from that very same period. And what is extremely important is... In the case of oracles, in that, at that stage, it was believed that the gods had spoken. That was so important that they had to write it down. It was not just humans speaking and so forth, everyday stuff. It was the gods had spoken, and therefore it was a procedure to write it down. So if we take this into account, then it's extremely unlikely that the oracles given to Abram would not have been written down. So they can make a very, very strong case that it was the Abrahamic history, the basic history, especially because it's the oracles. The oracles must have been written down according to the convention of the time. And what is more, for example, in the Akkadian epics, which was also delivered for a long time before it was written down, we, and we also have reference to oracles in that case. So we have the oracles in the context of a narrative, a story about these great kings. And in Mari, we have the same thing. We have these poets. They didn't only, uh, they were not only giving uh, the oracles, um, but they were also, uh, they wrote great epics of the gods. So the tradition of incorporating oracles within the story as we find it in the Abrahamic tradition, that's typical of uh, the Semitic tradition of that period. And that gives us reason to believe that the Abrahamic story was written down already at that stage. And if that happened at that stage, then it's very likely that the prehistory of the Abrahamic uh, family must also have been written down, most probably during that period, at least the source material. Now, your question is between the Israelite tradition and the Babylonian tradition. So because it developed basically in two different civilizations, but it came from the same original source, so to say. 
obviously there must be agreements because it go back to the same tradition. But after that tradition split in two, there must also with time differences develop. And that's how we see the differences. Now take for example, the deluge. Let me read you something here uh, about the Atrahasis epic. And it was written by one of the older scholars, Millard. And he wrote about this difference and agreements. It has yet to be shown that there was borrowing even indirectly. That's between the Deleuze story found in the Atrahasis epic and the one that's found in the biblical story. All who suspect or suggest borrowing by the Hebrews are compelled to admit large-scale revision, alteration, and reinterpretation in a fashion which cannot be substantiated for any other composition from the ancient Near East or in any other Hebrew writing. And listen to what he says further. In that the patriarch Abraham lived in Babylonia, it could be said that the stories were borrowed from there, but not that they were borrowed from any text known, now known to us. Granted that the flute took place, knowledge of it must have survived to form the available accounts. So that just gives one example when we can see the agreements, but especially also the differences between the different uh, real stories in, that we find in the primeval history in Genesis and that we find in Babylon. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you for, for clarifying that. Um, yeah, like I say, there's, again, when I read through the article, there is a lot of uh, material. I know you only went uh, broadly over some of the stuff and we focused on one element because there's a whole discussion on the uh, Sumerian kings list as well. Um, so, but yeah, I, I also want to be mindful of the time and we're getting a lot of questions in from the stream as well, which I think <laughs> would be good to address. So um, I don't know if you want to maybe lightly um, just to have like a broad overview of the Sumerian kings list, like just a quick why, why it's a sort of like an important piece of uh, evidence for the Sumerian hypothesis. Yeah, so I can say something about the king list. Um, so what is important about the king list is that the, um, what we find in the primeval history is a lot of genealogies. What we also find is rather long lifetimes of hundreds of years, nearly a thousand in some cases. What we also find is short biographical notes. Now, this particular grouping, these things coming together, this literary style is unique to the king list. We find it in the king list. The king list also have genealog genealogical lists also has these long lifetimes of hundreds, even thousands of years and short geographical notes. What is also important, I think, and this is, uh, I think, quite significant, is that in the biblical, um, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the primeval history, in this very same uh, genealogies, we find that the background is, in fact, Sumer, which is called the land of Sinia. So it places us in exactly the same geographical place. And what we also find is that certain persons, for example, Enoch, Nimrod, have equivalence in the Sumerian king list. What is also important is that it has been proposed by scholars that what happened in the king list, the king list had a certain kind of development in Sumeria. And some has proposed that there was a certain historiographical uh, process, a uh, project going on in Sumer. You remember the Sumerian period, period that expired, it was the end of that civilization. And the oral tradition, the continuous tradition, uh, I think there was uh, in many circles a fear that it would uh, dissipate and that, that it will become lost. And that was one of the reasons why it was written down. And it was included as notes in the King list. So there's a strong argument that the historiography um, that we find in the King list was a, a real project to write history in that 
during that time. And this is exactly how we should see um, the, um, the primeval history in Genesis, because it's a very similar historiographical uh, 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 project. Um, in fact, it's slightly more detailed than the one in the King List, because in the King List, you just have the different dynasties sort of uh, just arranged one under the other. But in the primeval history, we have a much more complex layout of how things evolved. So there's such an amazing agreement between the king list and the genealogies that we find in the primeval history. Uh, it's, you know, this is a kind of literature. This is a certain kind of literary style. There are only two documents that has this style. <laughs> it's the king list and it's the genealogies in the primeval history. Mm. And, you know, one of the things that we can be quite sure about is that no author would go and use a style from thousands of years ago when he writes something today. And the same would have, would have happened during the exile. It's extremely unlikely that someone during the exile would have used a literary style that was uh, for nearly 1,500 years, uh, not used, <laughs> suddenly you would have decided, okay, I'll write in that style. That seems to me very, very unlikely. So this is a, a great supportive argument that yeah. this whole process, this um, historiographical process project um, by the Abrahamic family was at the same time as that which happened in, in, in Sumer and Akkad during the uh, Eastern Lhasa, Lhasa period, that's between the Erdri period and the Old Babylonian period. And uh, we, again, we have a consistency, what happened in both countries at the same time, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, I think what we can do now, again, the, we can definitely, there are many uh, different other lines of argumentation that you also make, but I think we definitely covered some main points here. I, I think it would be good if we now can circle back now, when we can now compare the Babylonian and the Sumerian hypothesis with one another. Why then would you say, in conclusion, why should we accept the Sumerian hypothesis above the Babylonian hypothesis? And um, what are some faults of the Babylonian hypothesis, uh, meaning why it's not as good as an explanation as the Sumerian hypothesis? So I think the very first thing is uh, hermeneutics. Uh, it's the way of interpreting. So what has developed in scholarly circles is basically two different ways of reading the text. So we have an old biblical criticism school with a certain what we can call uh, interpretation, interpretation of sus suspicion, very suspicious of the text, um, not taking the text serious, um, in a, especially in a postmodernist framework where it's believed that the author is dead. So the only person of importance is the reader. That's very similar to the modernist perspective where only the reading subject was important. And the author was believed to be primitive, not very intelligent, pretty scientific, <laughs> not somebody to be taken seriously. So we have the same kind of thing in the postmodern period. You know, they, um, in my view, it's a bad philosophy. Because in hermeneutics, if we understand hermeneutics, hermeneutics is like dialogue. So if two people have a conversation and the one is the only one that thinks he has uh, something to say, he's the only one that knows something. The other one, he started to say dead for him. He has nothing to say to him. His view is not important. He can deconstruct it as he like. You know, that's exactly what we find in this approach, uh, this hermeneutical approach that we find in biblical criticism. So I do not believe it's a good approach. A better approach, I think, is what we find in hermeneutical philosophy. For example, hans Georg Gadamer, Paul Ricoeur, those guys. So what they say is that we should have respect for the text. So we should value the tradition. We should not be naive and just take everything as true. We should value the tradition, but 
We should not have suspicion from the start, hermeneutics of suspicion, and believe that the author could not have been right. And he didn't know what he was saying and is unworthy to listen to. We shouldn't do that from the start. We should first consider the text. And what these uh, great philosophers told us, uh, teach us actually, is very important. We should be like a disciple sitting at the feet of a master when we approach a text. We should really listen. First of all, listen. Listen carefully. And I think uh, when it comes to the hermeneutics involved, I think just it's not good hermeneutics that's been used in the biblical criticism approach. Once we use this kind of hermeneutics, and I have quite a, a, a section on this also in the article, then suddenly it becomes a possibility that the biblical author could have written something that really happened. It could have given us a good idea of a good perspective that we should listen to and then we can evaluate and then discuss it further. So what I believe is that the primeval history as a prehistory of the Abrahamic family should be taken serious. This is the first point, is the hermeneutics. The second point is, um, if you listened in the, right in the beginning, I said that the earlier scholars said that the Mesopotamian material were primarily found in the E source, or rather the non-P source. Nowadays, it said that the Mesopotamian material is found in the P source. <laughs> it's exactly the opposite. <laughs> so I don't think one can take that serious. You know, it just tell, tells us again that this whole theory about sources, this documentary hypothesis, is not to be taken seriously. Um, and then what is also important is when you read these, uh, these scholars, you know, they would say, for example, take the Deleuze as an example of Mesopotamian influence in the primeval history. But the rest, they don't even seem to know that all this uh, information right through the primeval history agrees with ancient Sumerian and Akkadian tradition. They don't even know it. Because in their view, it's only the deluge, more or less, that's really taken borrowed from the during the exile. But if you take, you consider the considerable amount, you know, we've just scratched the surface. We haven't even talked about a lot. We just talked a lot. We just considered a little bit of it's the stuff in the in the primal history. If we really consider it all, it's quite clear. They are extensive. It's, it's a lot of Mesopotamian material. So the question is, how did it originate? Where did it come from? And if there's no Babylonian influences, the most logical and sensible reason is, uh, is to say, but how did it happen? It must have been written quite early. And especially since it's right in the beginning before the Abrahamic story. I think all of these things gives us a good reason to think that the Sumerian hypothesis to be taken seriously. I can proceed, but... <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. No, okay. No, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. McLeod. And like I uh, also say, and it's good that you also mentioned it, yeah, it's only scratching the surface of how uh, deep we can definitely uh, go into this. But uh, thank you for sharing this with us. And uh, again, um, for everyone who wants to find out more, they could always go and look up your articles um, that are published in the journals and also go to your website um, and have a look there to do further reading and analysis. Yeah. So uh, thank you again for, for speaking with us. Um, if, if I may, I think uh, we can jump to the Q&A because there's a bit of a heated debate going on in our <laughs> Q&A section. Um, and so I think it would be cool if we could um, hear your insights on this. Uh, I will start there with our debate. It started with the question of, um, well, what does Dr. McLeod consider as the main evidences for the historical Abram? And then uh, we proceeded further, the discussion in the comment section proceeded further, that um, maybe you do not believe that the much of Genesis um, is historical, but is only mythologized uh, history. So I think we're, 
if I, and there's a lot of other comments in the debate as well. So please, for those who are commenting and debating and discussing, um, I hope I can summarize your question here correctly. But um, Dr. McLeod, do you consider Genesis as he, well, specifically that recorded in the biblical account? Um, and also when we speak about Abraham and stuff as historical, meaning that it really happened? Or do you only consider it as mythologized history? Uh, the Israelites just, uh, you know, uh, took kernels of small events and then just put a lot of extra uh, stuff and created their own narrative. Yeah, so let's start with Abram. I've already mentioned the Elamite um, incursion. And the fact that uh, the history tells us that something like that really happened means, in my view, that we should seriously consider the Abrahamic narrative. I've also mentioned the oracles. So the fact that oracles were written down when it was given, and that was the habit, that was the way of doing things. It seems to me extremely unlikely that the oracles in the Abrahamic narrative would not have been written down during that exact same period when Abraham was still alive. So I think these are good arguments towards supporting the historical story. But obviously, we don't have all the information, but I can proceed further. In my chronological model, it's a long story how it works and so forth. But what I do is I align the higher Mesopotamian chronology with the lower Egyptian chronology. And I've made a good argument for that. And then after I published it, it was um, published in... Um, 2019, after I published it, I discovered, or actually in that same year, the Epic of Kukishar was first translated in English, it became available. But when I read that, I saw, but wait, this supports what I'm saying. It supports my chronology dramatically, actually. So another article of mine was published um, in which I show how this epic provides dramatic confirmation for my chronology. Now, why is that important? Because in my chronology, which is based on the Iliacal rising of Sirius uh, during the reign of uh, Senesir, uh the third in his seventh year, now, the dating of that, according to the low chronology, is in 1836. I've just, in this um, article, I've just used the basic chronologies of Kitchener in the one hand. He has a lower and higher chronology for Egypt. So I did not tamper with that and argue and bring some other stuff. I just take, for, for methodological purposes, I just use this stuff. So 1836. When we use the Septuagint, and I believe this is very important, there's a small difference between the Masoretic text and the Septuagint. But I believe that the Septuagint in this case gives the better reading. And here it's about the 430 years um, towards the building of... Um, no towards the uh, period of the Exodus. So in the, in the Septuagint, that period actually starts with Abra, Abram traveling from Ur. And that is given as 1836. So we have the exact same year. Now, why is this important? Because in Egypt, Beni Hassan is an ex, uh, a, a very nice depiction of a man called Abishir. It's the same Amoratic name type than Abraham. And he is shown coming um, to Egypt. And he is described um, as uh, 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 in the text as an Asiatic, but the name he had used is of Shu. And that is a region Transjordanic on the other side of the Jordan, exactly the region from which Abram came. He has this multicolored 
Um, it's a beautiful uh, rope that he's wearing, reminding of the biblical story of Joseph. Um, there are so many other things. For example, him, he being noticed, and according to the biblical story, it was um, in this um, story that, uh, or actually where, where he was depicted um, in this grave. And what is extremely important is it's quite likely that the pharaoh must have known about this. Because Knumahutep II, in whose grave this was depicted, he was the administrator of the eastern desert. It was in his tomb that this was depicted. So there was a good connection with the king. It's most likely that the king could have taken notice, exactly as we read in the Bible. So there's a lot of things suggesting that Abishir might be just exactly the same person as Abraham. But until now, biblical scholars couldn't make the, the clear connection. Many have said, okay, there's a lot of agreement. But now we have the exact same year, 1836, that this happened. And I believe this is strong supportive evidence for a historical Abraham. Obviously, we cannot prove that Abraham existed. In fact, when one understands archaeology, you will immediately, immediately know that the possibility of proving people living during that early period is so, is so small. It's very, very difficult. If it wasn't a great king, especially in Egypt, you know, where the inscriptions were made on, on stone, etc., it's very, very difficult to prove that a certain person really existed. And in the case of Abraham, I believe we have quite a lot of supporting evidence. Now, when it comes to the primeval history, what I've said is what I believe there was a historiographical project by the Abrahamic family. So they wrote down the source material that was later incorporated in the primeval history and eventually, eventually in the book of Genesis. And I believe that was written, and when we take the Abrahamic story and the oracles into account, then I think it's quite possible. It seems the most logical thing that it was written during that very same period. So that the oral tradition was written down at that stage. Now, what I've shown in this article, this published article, is that we can reconstruct Sumerian history it's a very simple and uh, a good reconstruction of Sumerian history. When we use all the archaeological facts, all the data, as well as all the literature, all the ancient texts, and so on, we can make a reconstruction of ancient Sumerian history where the Uruk period is correlated with the first dynasty of Uruk. And when we do this reconstruction, then we find that the biblical narrative and the biblical outline of history has a remarkable match with this early Sumerian tradition. It fits remarkably well. Now, to what extent we should consider everything history is not so easy to answer. Um, because um, take, for example, the, the confusion of language. Um, when one just read it, it seems that God has sort of created language there. But I think if one carefully read the text, you'll see it's different Hebrew words used, for example, in that chapter 11 and in the previous chapter. And in the previous chapter, we read how the people migrated and so on, and the word used is the word generally used for, 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 for language. But here we have a different word, which I believe can be connected with the Sumerian context of the confusion of language at the end of the Uruk period. So sometimes if one read, just take the biblical text, it might seem like a myth. Uh, for example, in this case, how God created language. But if one connected with the earlier Sumerian tradition and understand the context, then suddenly this very same story can be understood in a totally different light. And there's a historical base, and one can see how the story uh, should be understood in that historical context. Um, so I think this is the problem, is if we don't have the historical background for a certain piece of 
of Lachita is very difficult to decide whether it's history or not. So what I'm doing is I'm showing how this story in the primeval history, stories, and the motives, everything, how that relates to that early Akkadian Sumerian tradition. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for answering that, uh, Dr. McLeod. Um, I'm trying to get you to everyone, uh, everyone's questions here. Um, I have well, an interesting one here. Um, is it your opinion that the Sumerians believed in the same God as the Israelites? <laughs> yeah, you see, there's such a lot in the article that we did not discuss. Yes. One of these things is the origins of the Hebrew God. I had a whole section on that. And it's not easy to just, you know, handle this in three minutes. <laughs> it's a complicated yes. topic. And uh, for me to really discuss it in a, you know, a, a good enough manner that it makes sense in every way, I, I won't even try it now. But what I can say is, let me put this in. Let me, let me, let me say this. What is interesting in the Sumerian tradition is they the father of the gods, that's the God above all the other gods. They wrote that God. His name was called An. It was written by uh, four uh, wedges. It was just a star. It just, if you, that same symbol uh, could mean God or could mean elevated or um, high or superb all these meanings. Now, what is interesting is that all the other gods as what we call a determinative behind the name of the god. All things in ancient Sumer had a determinative. That means after the word, they would put a certain sign which tells you, okay, this is a human, this is a tree, this is a god, etc. Now, this very symbol was placed behind the name of the gods to say this in key or whosoever is a god. But in the case of An, we do not find it. <laughs> it's just God. And why would that be? So I believe when one starts analyzing this, you remember the Sumerians were the first to write. So they take the earliest primitive concepts and their way of writing is a reflection of the way that they were thinking. So in writing on in this way, they are saying that he is God. And the best way to translate, um, I believe, on in the context of the language is the highly elevated one. It's exactly the same that we find later in Hebrew tradition. Um, El Elyon, the most high God, which is also the father of the gods in both cases in the council of the gods. So I believe the earliest gods, and also, let me actually add, in Sumerian tradition, this god was regarded as the first god before all the other gods. He was believed to have been the first, the very first god. So here we have a, con a concept of God the most high God, which was not just a God. There was, in later periods, we find that the, when this whole way of thinking was lost, that the sign for God was added afterwards, you know, then it was on and then the sign for God, which is just the same sign. But in this earlier period, it was not the case. So on was totally different regarded as different, as the father of the gods, as the god above all the other gods. So it's fascinating, but I just don't have the time now to discuss yes. this. But maybe, yeah, no, but it's definitely interesting, but maybe we could definitely have you on again to specifically discuss this question as well, because I would like to see how this intersects. Um, it's something uh, that I've been seeing. It's a a theory contrary to the evolution of religion hypothesis. Um, and it's uh, called the what's uh, original monotheism. And um, there's an interesting book by Dr. Winfred Gordon in the beginning God. And he makes a very interesting case as well. There's like the, you know, the evolution of religion saying it goes from the primitive to the higher view of God, the monotheism. 
but original monotheism like turns it around and says, no, there's an original concept of a monotheistic God that is not like the other types of gods. He was kind of always there. He maybe brought forth the other gods and he brought forth creation. And from there, there's a, a, a development. So that would be very interesting to intersect with um, your work that you've uh, discovered now with, uh, with you, you discussed now with Anne. So, uh, but thank you for sharing. Uh, um, I have another question here. Um, what does Dr. McCle uh, oh, sorry. What does the Sumerian hypothesis mean for the reliability of the Bible debate? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we have two views. The Babylonian hypothesis says that um, these stories were made up in stories in the primeval history and in Genesis, actually, more generally, even the story of Abraham. Some scholars would even regard that as a story that was actually produced uh, some time after the exile, cited during the Persian period. So if these stories were written during the Persian period, obviously they have no historical significance. And many scholars in the biblical criticism tradition has this opinion. So they don't believe there's any historical value. One scholar actually told or wrote regarding what I'm saying, biblical Israel would never have thought that there was a real flood. <laughs> so the mind is so made up about these things that, you know, it was just things that was written like there's no historical value to that. I'm saying exactly the opposite. But what I'm saying is not simple. What I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, here we just have uh, a, a clear account of history. I'm not saying that because it's not that simple. It's a tradition that's been handed over. Um, it was first an oral tradition. Let's take, for example, Adam, or which I equate with Adapa in the um, Mesopotamian or the Sumerian tradition. Now, according to the Bible and also in Sumerian tradition, we should, um, he left, if he really left, but According to the Bible, he left in about, say, five and a half, uh, using the Septuagint, about five and a half thousand BC, or maybe slightly later, but at that, in that early period. Now, remember, the first writing occurred towards the end of, or the beginning of the third millennium, 2,900 BC. That's 3,000 years later. So there's not, no question about oral tradition. Now, what we do find is it was not like our day and age where because we can write, we don't have a strong oral tradition. We, for example, find that the Akkadian king Sargon, his daughter, Enidwana, she writes in one of her poems. In this poem, as part of the poems, she says that the recitation by the poets, and she used technical words, must be exact and precise. So they had techniques shaped over many years to have an exact reproduction of certain stories. And that's why, for example, the Akkadian uh, tradition were only written down long after the Akkadian kings actually lived. Um, so we have this oral traditions, and especially in the Semitic tradition, there's a very strong oral tradition, and there's some other um, uh, good evidence that we find that some of these literary works were actually memorized. They were known from the heart, and we find it in the Bible also, where uh, reference is made to the table of the heart. So it's written on the tables of the heart, so you remember something. So the idea of remembering something and exactly remembering and handing it down correctly for a very long period, we're part of that ancient civilization and we don't understand it anymore. But we should take that into consideration when we try to understand the historiography of the primeval history. Okay. Okay, awesome. Thank you, uh, Dr. McLeod. Um, we have a few more minutes for uh, uh, um, a few more questions. Um, I have a question here. 
Um, well, you, you touched on, on, on Adam now, but I think the question um, is concerning the whole, and this is going, this is also, I know, a big discussion in and of itself. Um, but when you mentioned uh, the parallels with Adam, like um, what, like when we first discussed the hystericity question, um, can we also now apply this hystericity question now to, to Adam, uh, you know, um, uh, as recorded in the biblical tradition and also having a parallel in the Sumerian, uh, uh, Sumerian uh, tradition? Um, yeah, I think when it comes down to what, what are your thoughts on the hystericity of Adam? <laughs> Yeah, so I think that there's a certain point. You see, what I've just said is that here we have, obviously, this is very old oral traditions that we're talking about. Now, if we believe that there was such an historical person, there's absolutely no way that we can prove that. In fact, most of the people in the Uruk period, we can't prove their existence because it's before writing existed. It's absolutely impossible to, to show empirically that they ever lived cannot be done. We are reliant on the oral tradition. So at a certain point, faith kicks in. Certain things you can, will never be able to prove. But if you believe that this was a good um, and reliable oral tradition going back far into the distant past in ancient Mesopotamia for which you have good supportive evidence, then there's no reason not to believe that such a person lived in the Sumerian tradition. He's the first civilizer. He's a very important figure. He brought civilization to Sumer. He's the first known person in history, in that sense. Um, so I think we have good reason to think such a person existed. Okay. So the, yes, but you cannot prove you. it, obviously. Mm. Yes, <laughs> At yes. the end of the day, for a Christian, many of these things, it's a matter of belief. You can't prove it. It's beyond the possibility of empirical confirmation. We should accept that. Okay. Okay, th thank you uh, for ad addressing that, Dr. McLeod. Yeah, um, I think, uh, yeah, I think we're ending... We're nearing the end of our time now, but uh, looking also at our discussions and questions in the comments section, we definitely want you to come speak with us again because uh, um, these are important questions and important topics and many people have, um, have a lot of questions um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, very awesome to discuss this stuff. I certainly enjoy it as well and um, with all the discussions we've uh, had as well. So, uh, so yeah, I think, um, but for tonight now, I think we are going to end off. So again, Dr. McLeod, thank you so much for taking the time to come speak with us. And again, just to remind everyone, if you want to read up more, you can follow the links in the description and go and look for uh, Dr. McLeod's uh, papers if you want to find out more. So uh, thank you everyone for attending tonight's live stream. May you be blessed. And uh, Lord willing, we will see you all again next week. God bless and have a wonderful evening.